Hi, good morning. Welcome, welcome to the talk. <laughs> so I'm Pablo Villalba from Teambox. I'm an entrepreneur from Barcelona. Uh, five years ago, I started this company called Teambox. And, um, and we make essentially collaboration software. Uh, it looks something like, like uh, oops, sorry. Uh, sorry, this is not working. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not gonna. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so, sorry for that. So yeah, uh, we make a collaboration software company um, that for something that looks mostly like this. It's a software where you can share tasks and files with your team. Uh, at this moment, we're one of the biggest uh, startups in Europe and internationally that are doing collaboration software for companies. So you can think about it a little as a Facebook for your team, where you can share everything in the same place and, and collaborate together. So what I'm here to talk about is mostly our story. A lot of people uh, ask me about how we managed to grow this company, being here in Barcelona, but also expanding to the US. Uh, at the moment, it's been five years. Uh, we have raised $7 million in the company across different rounds. And I'm going to explain today how we did it and the different phases of uh, growth that we've been through. Uh, today we are, we are 36 employees, uh, maybe a little more, spread across Barcelona, where we have uh, development and support, and San Francisco, well, uh, Redwood City in California, where we have sales, marketing, and our headquarters. And today we are counting over 3,000 clients uh, from companies like this, but a lot of very small companies to departments in other organizations, or even whole college organizations who are using Teambox to collaborate. So uh, the story of our company is something is somehow split between the two cities. We started here in Barcelona. It was just me as a sole founder. And uh, little by little, um, we, were, we were discovering that our target market was really international and that it made more sense to be to be located somewhere where we could access that market in, in a more global way. So we were slowly moving our business to, to the Bay Area. It started with a few trips to San Francisco, discovering the local environment, the culture, um, discovering the needs that the company had, and making, like, taking the steps to, to eventually get there. Uh, I like to show this graph because it shows very well how the company has been progressing from from the very beginning. Like sometimes it's, it's misleading to look at revenue, maybe, uh, or, or attraction only. Uh, I wanted to show this a bit as the combination of what you're seeing here is the number of activities that are creating every month in our system. You can think about them as tweets or status updates that people are collaborating on or tasks. So when we started, we had essentially no activity, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. I'm sure if I have a laser here. Yeah. When we started, we had essentially no activity. We were for a few months uh, working on the product, trying to see what would make sense, validating with a, a few people. And we were in the minimum viable product stage. Damn it. We were in the minimum viable product stage. Uh, at, this, at this point, we still don't know if customers are going to want what we are building. Uh, we still don't know very much the features that we are going to be shipping. Um, and we're mostly validating. Uh, essentially, we have a few people that are using it, but our metrics are not very good. From this, we advance to the first sales that we have. Once the product is ready, we open the, we open the credit card system, and we start charging people. And from this moment, uh, we start learning a lot more about customers, because now we have to keep them as active users, but we also have to keep them as customers. So what you can see is that, essentially, the activity level is pretty flat in this stage, partly because we have a very small team that's not able to iterate uh, as fast as we would like to. We're trying to make a very ambitious product. Uh, in the sales, like once we start selling, activity goes up a little, but still not significantly. And it's thanks to, thanks to raising rounds of funding that we're able to make releases that make the product bigger, faster, better. And this is where, in the third version of the product, we finally find that people like what we're doing, they're willing to buy it. They want more of it. And we're like, OK, we think, uh, we think it's been worth it. Like, We're at the point that uh, we need to scale as a company. 
So from this point, we start looking for, for larger funds. We start looking for uh, venture capital. And this has been the last year, like the year before this one, where we've really had like, a more explosive growth. So the rounds of funding that we've been through in the company was essentially, at the beginning, we were self-funded. It was uh, around 25,000 euros of my own money, where I just hired a few developers, I paid for the servers and everything. We just had an initial prototype, not much to see. Later, we moved to the first business angel round. We, we raised 30,000 euros here in Barcelona. Because we were a very early stage company, um, it, caused, like, it, took a, it took time to find these investors that would trust in the product. Like, essentially, it was me and a few other developers. We didn't have a business team. We didn't have a sales team or anything. But still, it allowed us to complete the product, make a first release, and reach a few milestones. Uh, the second business angel round took place a few months after. Hi, Jordi. <laughs> we actually have uh, the leader of the second round here. <laughs> and in this, in this phase, what happened was interesting because we had the product that was already like, OK, we know that there's something interesting. But we know that there's all this missing, and we're going to need a lot more. So what we did is we raised, we raised private, private money for 250000 and. Because Barcelona is, well, Spain and Barcelona have these programs where they're supporting entrepreneurs. We were able to ask for public, public loans where the government helped us complete the private funding with, uh, with essentially what was a loan. And the government was lending us money, so we had a multiplier effect. So this was a process that, that took a lot of paperwork. It felt like we were working on something not for the product, but more like for all the bureaucracy that it needed. But it, it, meant, also, it meant a lot for the company, too, because we were able to do things that we hadn't been able to, to done otherwise. Uh, after that, you notice that everything here is in dollars so far. At this point is where we, th we think, OK, well, we really want to become an international company. And if we want to become an international company, we know we have to go to the, the US. So I'll explain why, but we did something called a convertible note to help us raise funds. And this was the time of the US transition, where we were taking the company that was essentially Spanish with a you know, couple contractors in the US. But we were trying to, to turn the legal structure and, and everything into something that would be international. And uh, damn. sorry. Yeah, there we go. And after that, uh, we already reached a lot of milestones. The activity levels are pretty good. The customers are reaching several thousands. And now we think, OK, we have a business that's growing. Uh, we're growing almost three times a year in revenue, like every single year. Uh, we reach a million dollars in, in uh, revenue. So now is when, finally, we're ready to raise VC funds. So you see, it's, it's been a really long process of uh, three, four years since the moment that we start the company until we really reach all these milestones to be able to, to have solid revenue, have something recurring, and attract um, something on the scales of a VC. So if we compare this to the graph I was showing before of the stages of development of the product, this was founder equity, like my own money. This was the first round of angel funding. And the second round, these are like the crazy people who bet in this company that they have no idea where it's going to go, but they're hoping it will go somewhere. Eventually, we get the government loans as well. And here is where we complete with, uh, with uh, local venture capital in Spain and other angels that help complete the round. And when metrics are already going like this, that was the right moment for us to go, pitch to venture capital firms, and uh, you know, we, closed, uh, we closed a sizable round uh, pretty quickly once we had those. So, sorry, I'm having trouble with this. <laughs> OK, so uh, the stage of the company also is, is very marked by the funding that we had at the time. Initially, it was more like a lifestyle startup where I was simply in Barcelona because I was here. It was not like a conscious choice, but it was a perfect city, and I felt like working on this. Uh, we had major constraints because we didn't have any money. I basically didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but we were able to complete a basic product, a proof of concept to show people, hey, this is what we want to build, and we're serious about it because we have a prototype. 
So after that, damn, OK, stop. After that is when we went for angel funding. I was, uh, I was in an incubator here in Barcelona in Seed Rocket. Uh, we had about 5,000 users and the, the MVP ready. Uh, we met the first business angel in the incubator. So the achievements that we had in this, in this period were, OK, we had a product that was in Spanish. It was a prototype. It was not very good. This time we launched it in English, we launched it to more people, we started getting attention in blog and, and in the press, and uh, you know, we, we started building a small team. We transitioned from being something with uh, contractors, with collaborators, to being full-time people who were working on this. After that, we had more angel funding. The product was, you know, was more mature, and this was when we started making the first trips to, to the US. Uh, going to San Francisco was really interesting because there's a, there's a vibrant ecosystem. There's a lot of talented people trying to do things. But we also discovered, like, oh my god, like, we are here and we are this small. And if we want to build something, like, we have to be way, way more advanced. So we raised more money. We matured the team, added investors of, of uh, you know, somebody who could help us make this transition to the US, uh, somebody who could understand software as a service. And at this point, we're talking like in the first stage, we only have 5,000 users. In this stage, we already have over 100,000 users, which is a nice number. We have building relationships with customers who trust us. Some people have been with the service for more than a year paying. So things are looking better. Now, the problem is I tried to raise VC money in Spain, and I mostly failed. And the reason why we failed, a lot of people will blame the ecosystem, that they're not ready, that they're not taking enough risks. I think uh, we were to fail, like we were to blame, really, because the product wasn't mature enough. We didn't have a team. We didn't have enough traction. So uh, you know, it was, it was a really risky company. And uh, it was a risky bet for anyone. So I visited everyone I could. And everybody said, no, we think this is not fundable. So we were essentially uh, this valley of death where the expenses are increasing, and we are still not making enough money. And we need to spend even more money to make more money. And uh, essentially, the company was in a really bad situation because we didn't know if we could get out of here. We could either like, reduce expenses, grow more slowly, and eventually lose in a market that was getting more crowded. And basically, we had this chicken and egg problem of, th of thinking, well, we really need to raise money so we can afford to grow this service and make it something, something that ha has real quality. But the amount of money we need for that is so big that uh, we're not even worth that. So we would essentially be giving away the whole company if we, raised, if we raised that much money. And also, nobody would do it because they would be crazy to invest in this small company. So what we did is we found this solution uh, called a convertible note. And uh, how many of you are, are familiar with convertible nodes here? OK, probably worth explaining it. So essentially, what we did is we told people, OK, um, we are going to raise money. And we are not going to decide how much the company is worth today. Because today, it's not worth very much. But if you uh, agree to put in money, what we're going to do is try to prepare the company to build the traction so we are in a good situation to raise a real VC round. And uh, what we're going to do, this is going to be our target. We want to raise something like a few million dollars at a decent valuation. So what we're going to do is that when we raise that money, that is going to be the valuation you have, but I'm going to give you a significant discount. So if you put in, for example, $1 million today, and a year from now, we close funding for a $10 million valuation. Instead of you coming at $10 million, I'm going to give you a discount. So you can come in, for example, at $7 million. So the moment that that transaction closes, you are making money instantly. Because you're getting something that's worth $10 million for the price of $7 million. Um, so yeah, uh, we opened this. And this time, we take the initiative. It's not like we are going to pitch to people and tell them you should really invest. This time, we are simply, we open it. And we create this profile. So well, before this, before this, there was a pretty big uh, hole in the team that was, we didn't have a, like a more professional CEO. So the first thing I did was, through a recruiter, I was interviewing different candidates. We eventually found somebody in the software as a service industry that we really liked. Uh, we brought him on board to the company. So on one side, he started maturing the company. 
And we also let him know the strategy, like, hey, we're going to raise money even if uh, things are kind of tough today. Our plan is that we will have enough money to be able to, to execute properly in a full team. After that, we decided that, OK, we want to be leading this round. We want to tell people what the valuation is going to be and have them decide if they want to say yes or no. And when you're doing this, you're having a much different uh, discussion that, than when you're talking to people and you're just saying, hey, fund me. Let's talk about valuation. Let's talk about things. Because this time, you're telling them, this is what we have. This is the opportunity. You can buy or you cannot buy. So we made a, this angel list profile, and we set the terms. OK, we want to raise $1 million and a half dollars. And we went out, and we talked to anyone who could be interested. So two things happened. Here in Barcelona, somebody that I was talking to says, yes, we're interested. And they put in something like uh, half of the amount. In Madrid, somebody discovers us, uh, the VC that invested in us, Entre Canales, discovers us through angel list. We had a few phone calls. We meet in person, and they agree that they like the company, they like what we're trying to do, and they want to come in before the VC round happens. So with this, they put in money. We still don't know the valuation. It doesn't convert. They are not shareholders yet. It's more like they're loaning us money. And we start executing in this, in this plan. We complete the round with uh, eventually almost, almost 10 people, very small investors, and these two main lead investors. And now, now that we've done all this, we have a million and a half dollars in the bank. We actually sold a little more than that because we made a mistake. But uh, a little more than a million and a half. And we use that to grow the company as much as we can. So we were here. We were in this rate of growth. But once we, once we have extra funding and we accelerate everything we can, our activity starts growing very quickly. And our product starts working better. Our sales go up. And we start growing revenue three times a year. Like We keep growing our revenue three times a year, which wasn't very impressive before because it was low. But now it's kind of awesome because you know, it starts having a higher volume. So in this phase, what we achieve is we establish a sales team that is able to you know, take orders, charge people, sell to more mature customers. We incorporate the CEO, and we start turning the company more like from a group of friends in a garage into something more serious. You know, because we're in the professional collaboration space. And we start working on our metrics and the product. So the results are pretty good. And, uh, and yeah, eventually, eventually we look at things and we say, well, we think, we think this is the right moment to raise an A round. And now we're talking to people, and now they know us because we're at the top of some marketplaces. And this is when you know, big customers are, are coming in. And we say, OK, we need $5 million. We find it very quickly. We agree on a turn sheet. That's good for the company. Uh, you know, there's only one requisite. That is, uh, right now, legally, we were a Spanish company. Uh, the VC, because they were American, they wanted the company to be American too, so they would be familiar with the legislation. Uh, so we we establish this redomestication process. That's very long. It's essentially it's essentially taking a company that's in Barcelona, that's a Spanish company, and saying. We want to become an American company. And that involves a lot of lawyers, um, very expensive process. But eventually, after one year, we get there. We cash in the money. Everybody who trusted us before from the convertible note becomes a shareholder. And everybody's really excited about the company. So, let's see. I said, OK, so after the Series A, what does it change to have all this money? Because we've been, we've been living in a very low budget all the time before. So we, the first thing that happens is that we start hiring the best people we can find, because why not? Like We want to work with a team that's not a really big team doing a lot of diverse things. We want to work with a smaller team that will, do, will be very talented. So we start hiring a VP of product, better engineers. We have constant job openings. The mobile team becomes something in-house. Um, and we split the company a little. So we, we decide to have, in Barcelona, development and support. Partly because all, all the DNA is here, like the, the founding team and the product team is here in Barcelona, but also because it's just a great place to have developers. Uh, the salaries are affordable. And it's not like they're, they're cheap or anything. Uh, but the talent is very high quality talent. There's better retention. And honestly, I think it's, it's great for the culture that, that we kept this. We don't want to move this. We want to keep development and support always in Barcelona. As for California, we've been trying to do transition roles. Uh, for now, sales and marketing, we're already there. 
like we've or we had already moved this to the States because it just made sense selling to the US market. And we also moved headquarters there. So now we have all the board meetings, anything that's legal or executive takes place in California. More things that happen after the Series A is that we start having board meetings. Uh, things are more serious, you know, like numbers are bigger and there are bigger decisions. So once a quarter, more or less, we get together with the investors and, and we have these board meetings where we review how the company is doing. We establish better processes for development, support, sales, and because the team is growing bigger, there's some people who never met each other, so it becomes a necessity to fly people over, to have frequent meetings, um, you know, just to have a more personal contact with everyone. So was it worth it going through all this? It sounds like a really long and painful process. Uh, I think it was. The company's uh, revenue is at millions of dollars still. It's still growing at two or three X a year, which is pretty awesome for this stage. And uh, from the part of the founder, like, yes, we have a significant dilution, but we still have, like, I still have because I'm <laughs> the only founder. <laughs> um, early investors, we still have a pretty significant part of the company, which uh, I think is important to, to, you know, to keep identifying with it. And we also have an established team and management. And in fact, it's so established that, that uh, I was able to leave my company last month. Uh, just because everything was being taken care of, and I didn't feel the need to be there as a founder anymore. So uh, that's, that's the story of how we did everything for Redbooth, formerly known as Teambox. And I wanted to show you a bit how I'm doing it again, because why not? <laughs> and uh, how I'm trying to do things differently this time. So a uh, little bit of a story. Sorry for the porn. Uh, this was. This was me half a year, no, a year ago, more or less, nine months. And this was me three months ago. I went, I went through all these things as a company. I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm really not doing anything personal. So I decided to get in shape. And I did. And I, I found this to be something very motivating. And I decided to start a new company about it to help more people do that. So um, this, is, this is what I'm going to share with you is the pitch deck of the new company I'm building. So you can have an idea of, of how that process looks for a new company. Uh, my com new company is called Edfit. It's pre-launch. We're going to be launching in two or three weeks, maybe. And uh, what I'm doing differently this time is even if I'm a Spanish citizen and I'm still in Barcelona, I'm establishing the company directly in the US. Because I'm thinking that what I want as a company is to reach the broadest market I can. And uh, you know. I could make that here, but then I would have to go through the whole transition process again. So I thought, why not make it directly in the States? So I'm doing that. Uh, the app is basically a mobile platform where you can have your, your training programs, you can have your nutritional programs, and it will teach you. We place, a, we place emphasis in like, teaching you how your body works so you can, so you can understand that better. Uh, we, um, there. We give you tools to plan your day. Uh, we give you programs with brief but intense workouts that stimulate like uh, weight loss and, and getting in shape faster. And we're trying to give tools for progress tracking. So if you're trying to hit a specific goal, like losing body fat or, or losing weight, uh, you can keep progress of that. So it's a lot like a game. Um, so here's the pitch. Um, a little we focus on the product first because, because we're pre-launched mostly. We're trying to explain what we're trying to do. In the meantime, while I'm doing this, I'm preparing a prototype. And um, you know, we're trying to position ourselves in a place that will be unique, because it would be a mistake to try to make something like everyone else is doing. So in the, in the pitch, what we're trying is to position ourselves more as a general appeal app that a lot of people can find appealing. But it's more prescriptive, like we tell you the program. So what we did when I was thinking of wow, I want to do something in the fitness space, is I just took a look at everything I could find in that space and tried to position it here. Like, OK, we have workout apps, we have nutritional trackers, we have wearables, specific apps for different things. So what was the part that was missing for me is more like a coach. And we decided, OK, we're going to fill in this gap in the market and try to, try to build a solution for that. Uh, 
for raising money, uh, we are trying to compare this to what's happening in the market. I think the market is in a really hot space because a lot of transactions are taking place. My fitness pal has raised an uh, incredible valuation, 18 million recently. They have 40 million users. Other apps that are mobile have millions of users as well. And all these mobile and quantify self trends are converging. So like, the way we're trying to position this is like, well, we're at this really interesting space where something can happen. Now it's early, and now is the moment to come in. So here's how we're, I'm positioning it. Before, I was raising money very incrementally, like only for what we needed in the next months. This time, I'm trying to raise significant, uh, like a more significant amount of money ahead. Uh, in the pitch, I'm listing 250K for launch. And essentially, what I'm trying to do is cover the expenses for a whole year so we don't have to worry about it and try to reach profitability immediately within the first year. Because if, you are, if you're in an expensive space like software as a service where you need to invest a lot of money acquiring users before you can start making money, then you're always going to be needing to raise another round and, and get more funding and get bigger. And, and it's just like, it's a very exhausting race. So what we're trying to do here is start with something small, make it so sufficient, keep expenses low, and then start growing with a small team. We're talking that we have only three founders here, uh, and that's practically going to be the team. So uh, wrapping up, for anyone who's thinking about raising funds here and or going to the States, uh, what I would th think is, OK, take a look at what you have, at which stage you are in a company. And uh, if you need money, think really if you need money. If you need it, try to raise what's appropriate for that moment in the company. And if you can't reach that, think about the milestones that you will need to achieve before getting there. Uh, funds are, like I said, this here is like a means to a goal. You should be very clear about what you're going to do with them. Is it, am I going to establish a huge team? Am I going to build a great product? Am I going to hire top talent? Um, and once you know that, you work, you work backwards and you say, OK, what do I need to get there? And how much is it going to cost? And always be aware of uh, the time and the effort that funding can take you, um, and also of loss of control that can mean bringing in new people, executive staff, investors, and how that can affect the culture. So that's the talk, basically. Um, if you want to check them out, that's the first company I was talking about. It's called Redbooth because we changed the name. Uh, it fit is a new one I'm working on. And if you want to stay in touch, I'm in Twitter. I'm in Barcelona normally, and I will be in San Francisco a bit later this year. Thanks. <laughs> so we have for Q&A. Uh, anyone has any questions? Yes? You need a microphone, right? There should be one. Just a moment. This, uh, yeah. So Pablo, are. thanks for sharing that uh, interesting in information okay. with us. And um, my question would be primarily where you were raising money at different stages of your company. Mm -hmm. uh, can we maybe go back to that slide? And sure. can you explain a little bit how you spent that money that you raised at the different stages? That'll be great. There. Yeah. yeah. So how, sure. how do you spend it, basically? So you got mm -hmm. your first 30 key, then we saw 250, 600, and so on. Uh, do you have a vague idea, more or less, how much money went into marketing, how much money went into product development, how much money yeah. went into the lawyers you mentioned, for example. Oh, that was really expensive. <laughs> yeah, uh, essentially founder, I had no salary. Um, I was basically hiring developers, so it was only development. A small part of that went to buying a domain, to paying servers, but it was mostly just paying people. In the first round, it was the same. We still had uh, like extra expenses, like now we have to make taxes, pay for the incorporation. But that was a very low amount, like pay for the office, very low. Everything was just paying people. And everybody was a developer at this time. There was no salespeople at all. Uh, in the second angel round, um, thanks to Jordi, we started making uh, a few, like some new bets. 
and we say, hey, we should really try spending some money in marketing. We should hire a salesperson. So I would say at that phase, it's about 80% development, and the rest is like we try a few things with sales, marketing. Actually, it would be more like 70% because they were, they're also like trips that we're planning. We try to fly the people over to, to get immersed in this new culture. So yeah, this point is mostly, it's mostly development up until here. Because as you can see, the product is not very mature. It's still like things are only getting started. Then once we have the loans, we are more comfortable and we can spend in more things. So at this point, we spend a little more in marketing. Like we have a full-time person that's trying to post things. We have two full-time people that are doing sales. And we experiment a little with you know, interns, designers, to see what works, what doesn't. So I would say development in this phase would be down to 60%, maybe 30% sales, marketing, stuff, and you know, random expenses. And at this point is when things really start changing, because we bring in the, the CEO. We bring in another full-time person from the States that's like more expensive. Uh, we turn some of the people in the company from uh, sales to operations, and here, it starts looking a lot more like a real company. It's still very high in development, because that's our culture. But I would say, if anything, it's a little below 50% in development here. Uh, and at this point, we start also having like considerably higher lawyer fees, because we're preparing the redomestication. The redomestication process costs around 300,000 euros, which really hurts to think about. Because if we had, I mean, yeah. It could be anything, right? Because if we had started directly in the States, we wouldn't have the loans. Uh, but you know, it's a trade-off. It was also very uncertain, because we didn't know it took a full year to process, so we could have lost everything. The funding co could have fallen through in the meanwhile. And uh, nowadays, yeah, nowadays, I would say development is just another department. We have support, development, mobile, executive staff, uh, operations, we, we have bigger chunks that are going to marketing. So yeah, I would say right now we're, we look more like an established company, expense-wise. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes? Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could share some tips uh, if we happen to follow the same path and incorporate in the states uh, to mm -hmm. get funding for our growth stage, um, how can you can how you can have a smooth proce process with Hacienda from Spain? You know, it, uh, making the flip from uh, you know uh, headquarters in Spain to mm -hmm. headquarters in. So you mean being a Spanish company, go to the yeah. states? Uh, depends which stage you're in. Are you initially like is it an initial idea? Are you making money? Do you have loans? Uh, no, no loans, uh, yeah, making money. OK. Well, there are two options. Like, you can make a different company and transfer all the IP to that company. If you don't have any loans, that's relatively easy. Uh, you can also close and open again, or you can try to redomesticate. The reason why we did redomestication is because the company was already complicated. We had uh, hundreds or maybe thousands even of building relationships with customers. So we were invoicing people. We had contracts. We had loans. So we couldn't just close down the company and open a new one. That would be like fraud. Uh, you know, it's, it just wouldn't make sense. So we had to transfer the company to move everyone over. But if you are making money and the company is in a simpler state and everybody agrees, then it might be a better option to just open a new company and transfer everything you have to that one. Again, it depends if it makes sense for you and so on. In terms of raising money, if you want to raise money now, what I would suggest is instead of negotiating with, e with each person, open something like a note and allow people to come in. So publish a valuation. And you what I would recommend is instead of negotiating every time, is just saying, hey, we're looking for this. This is our valuation. If you like it, come in and join our round, instead of going individually to each, uh, to each pitch, because that would be harder to negotiate. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. 
Good morning. Hello. Hello. As a founder, mm -hmm. and you've done a fantastic job, and we can see the numbers and the growth, and you're always talking about you know, client-facing and becoming an international company, but as somebody who started at the ground, what advice would you give for leaders? Because founders ultimately are trying to be leaders as well as mm -hmm. build something. Are there any lessons you've learned that you, that you would like to share with us and advice? Well, you know, when you're trying to start something with this little money, you really, <laughs> you really need to, ha to convince people, like to sell people of your vision. And uh, that can be really complicated because you have to ask people to take pay cuts, to, to you know, have this sense of belonging to something larger. And um, it comes with a lot of complications because people need money to live and they have families and they have projects and dreams and opportunities. So I think it's, it's really important that if you need more people, that you're able to compensate them appropriately. So they will be able to join you like with their mind, but also like with their opportunity in life, like that moment. Uh, and I think it's very important to be able to show that you're making this, those sacrifices too. So for example, for a very long time, I, I had no salary at all. I was just doing whatever I could <laughs> to live off that. And eventually, I couldn't anymore. So the company was doing better, and we took it. So I think it's important to just show the vision, to, to make people, help people identify with the adventure, give them shares, like let them know that they're, they're part of the project. They're not just working for it. And, uh, and if you're not able to do that, or if you really need a, a larger commitment, then you probably need to raise more money to, to get started, because it's, it's not very sustainable to do that for more than a year, I guess. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Um, one question, what do you think are some key differences between the investors in Spain and investors in the US? And what do you think needs to change so that in the future we can start up our companies here and have investors mm -hmm. start believing in these ideas earlier on in Spain? Well, a lot of things are already happening. Like when five years ago, it was, it was much harder to raise money in Spain. Now we have all these accelerator programs, like pitching places, associations of business angels and investors. And I think things are looking a lot better. Before, before it was complicated to start a company in Spain because you know, it was hard to make recurrent charges online. It was, it was just hard to be a new company. But that's changed a lot. So nowadays, if I was targeting the Spanish market, I would probably start a company here because why not? Now, the problems, the problems that there are is that we don't have a, such a big ecosystem yet. So it's harder to, to find somebody who really fits you. If you go to something like Silicon Valley, you have all kinds of investors. So you have people who specialize in seed, people who will, who will like, follow you as you're scaling, and um, people who specialize in mobile, in games, and they understand that really well. Well, here we're earlier. It's a smaller community. So I think it's just a matter of time and maturity that we'll, we will get there. Also, like we, we need more people willing to take on A rounds, because there's not that many people who can give you 5 million in Spain, only a handful of firms. Questions? No? Oh, there's one here. <laughs> we have five minutes. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the cultural changes. You mentioned that you were bringing in more people, you were bringing mm -hmm. in a CEO. So mm -hmm. what were the real challenges you had, and how did the culture change? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the culture follows a bit the, like whoever is at the face of the company will attract, will attract people like that. So initially, we attracted a lot of hacker types, just because I'm a hacker. And I like people like that. <laughs> and that's what I was looking for. These people were happy to work on a project because it was interesting. They were working more for a challenge, for something that was fun, and that they could feel that was partly theirs. Well, now as the company matured, uh, we've been attracting more people who are more senior, really capable, but who treat it more like, OK, this is my job. I'm coming here, and I'm adding to this company. But yeah, it's. It's more becoming like a company, more than an adventure. 
about it's, structures. It's, it's probably a good thing for yeah. customers and for, for everyone involved. So it's about structures, processes, you lose flexibility, yeah. is that type of exactly. stuff. Exactly. For example, yeah. back in the days, we would just make something and we would say, ship it. And that would be it. We would ship a major feature and we would go drinking. And it was Friday and something would crash. It was horrible. Now that can never happen because we have a three-step process where we develop something first, people review it, it goes to QA, then it gets deployed to production. So you're looking at doing something and only seeing it maybe next week in the server. Um, companies like Facebook do this. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that your company is moving slower because you're still doing a lot of things, but there's all this delay and there's extra steps that make it not that much fun for a hacker, but uh, a much better idea as a company. All right. Thank you. OK. Uh, we have time for a last question. Anyone has one? No? OK. Oh, one more. Um, hi. Um, why the name 8-Fit? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> It's 8-bit because it's a reference to 8-bit, like the games that were 8-bit, like Zelda. And the idea comes because we want to make it, we want to make fitness become something like a game where you get addicted, you you level up, and you, you know, you find good things. And it's not a game that you play in a computer or in a phone. It's like a game that you're progressing through in, in your real life and, and that you can see results. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Last question? No? Okay. We'll leave it here then. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>